Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending the latest edition of Milestones webinar series. Um, we are so, so pleased today to be presenting Ted Jenkin in this presentation of It's Not Too Late, Tax Saving Strategies uh, that can still be implemented for the 2021 year, um, as well as we'll discuss some things that hopefully you were doing in 2021 that you can do in 2022 if you weren't already doing them. Um, today, Ted Jenkin, you probably already know him through reputation. Um, he's the CEO and founder of Oxygen Financial. He's presented on pretty much every media outlet from Fox News to CNN, MSNBC, everything in between. Um, wherever somebody's talking about a financial topic, you'll find Ted Jenkin speaking as one of the experts. Um, today, he's gonna roll us through a complete presentation on all sorts of strategies that you can save on your tax uh, bill at the end of the year end. Um, so again, Milestone, we specialize in qualified settlement fund administration, settlement planning, and attorney fee deferral. And we're just so happy today to have Ted Jenkin here speaking with us. And uh, Ted, I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sam. Thanks, uh, Milestone, for having me uh, here today. I'm going to bring Sam back in in just a couple minutes to talk about one of these strategies that are real specific for attorneys. Sam, being an attorney, is so great to talk attorney to attorney about some of these strategies. Uh, we also specialize in attorneys, so we know the field uh, extremely well. Uh, before we get started today and I get on to 2021 year-end tax planning <clears throat> and also talking about 2022, if you wouldn't mind, um, just because there's a lot of people on the broadcast today, in the questions box, if you could let us know that you see the screen and you hear us okay. Uh, I've done enough of these webinars that sometimes between internet, uh, where the weather is or whatever it may be, these things can get a little bit wonky in terms of, uh, in terms of speed sometimes. So if you don't mind just letting us know that you can see us, hear us, uh, that'll be great. And uh, we're gonna give you a lot of great information today. Some of this may be uh, drinking through a fire hose. Certainly ask questions along the way and uh, we'll make sure we answer everything that we can. If it's real specific to your situation, we may have to take it offline, but we'll answer everything that we can. But let me give you a lot of ideas today. And uh, as Sam mentioned, um, I spend a lot of my time uh, talking to business owners and specifically attorneys about how to save money in taxes. And I've had the good fortune to be able to do a lot of, a lot of uh, TV and media uh, almost every weekend. You can see me on headline news if you uh, turn, tune it on, talking about various topics. But this was a, a clip just a few months ago before uh, the war started where I was already talking about gas prices and, and what was happening and some of the trends that we were seeing overall. And it's very interesting right now because a lot of people are talking about inflation, but I think one of the things that you may be wanting to watch out for when you shop for things is shrinkflation. And shrinkflation is really that period of time where you have product companies that start to literally shrink the packages of the goods and products that they offer you to maintain the margins in their company. Of course, big companies like Procter & Gamble are not gonna eat their margins in half, so how do they keep their margins and maintain them? They just change and shape the contents of the packages that you buy. So one thing just to become more conscious about now is when you're going shopping, and I'll give you some recent relevant examples, Gatorade just shrunk their containers from 32 ounces to 28 ounces. Aleve just changed their number of caplets in a bottle from 190. Crest just changed the number of ounces in their toothpaste from 4.1 ounces to 3.8 ounces. And so, you know, one of the things to recognize in here in general is that people are talking about a, a basically an 8% inflation. I actually think shrinkflation uh, is a bigger issue that you're going to see coming from a shopping perspective and when you dine out across the board and then possibly stagflation uh, after that. So uh, appreciate that intro. Uh, I thought what I wanted to just get you to be thinking about as we go, we're going into this is that, you know, there's a big difference between tax planning and tax preparation. Most of you are probably in that process where you either filed an extension or you're in the, you know, 11th hour of getting your tax prep done. And far too often for business owners and a lot of attorneys that I talk to, 
there isn't a lot of forethought with doing uh, tax planning overall. And I, I've literally met thousands of CPAs and so many CPAs are really good at preparing the taxes, but most CPA firms, even a lot of the large ones, don't spend a lot of time really putting forethought into creating a tax plan to save as much as you can today and then thinking about how you can save money tomorrow. <clears throat> now, if you're a betting person, one thing you might wanna be considering going in today is that we just crossed $30 trillion of deficit in terms of total federal deficit. Our fiscal deficit is slightly over $2 trillion. And when you consider what makes up that deficit, you know, like your budget at home, it's really about expenses and income. And the government doesn't sell Jeep Wranglers and it doesn't make cheeseburgers. So how does the government make money and how does it spend money? Well, on the spending side, when you look at the top four line items in the fiscal budget right now, it's Medicare, Medicaid, number one, Social Security, number two, defense, war, if you will, but defense is number three. And what's really creeping up at number four is the net interest on the debt. Despite the fact that a lot of people believe that foreign entities own most of our debt, we own most of our own debt. And if you think about the interest we pay ourselves, it's largely predicated on the 10-year treasury. As the 10-year treasury rate goes up, we sort of tighten the noose around ourselves because that net interest on the debt um, continues to go up. So how do we get revenue? It's not that complicated. Like I said, we don't, we don't make cheeseburgers and we don't sell Jeep Wranglers. We get a lot of our money from corporate income tax, personal income tax, payroll tax. And I want you to consider that last year in America, 57% of all people in this country did not pay one dime of federal income tax, not one dime. Now, some of that was pandemic driven, but prior to that, before the pandemic, it was about 44%. So if you consider that one out of two Americans don't pay any taxes at all, we're in a massive deficit right now, where will the tax money come from? So I put this slide up in here just to get you noodling on this, that if you're a betting person, <clears throat> where do you think taxes will go over time? Will they go up? Will they stay the same or will they go down? And this may be the consideration about how you do tax planning today. And maybe when you think about the methodology about how you distribute money down the road for getting taxes to come out. So we're gonna talk about strategic tax ideas maybe before you file, if you're close to it here in April and then some really things to ponder into 2022. And where I wanna bring Sam back in is that <clears throat> Sam and I have done a bunch of joint work. Uh, we've worked on this with a lot of attorneys across the country, but there are a lot of strategies that are out there that can really help attorneys. And some of these you're gonna to wanna to look at closely. You may or may not have heard of these before. And I wanna bring Sam to talk into one that you may wanna consider here in 2022. And then I'll revert back to 2021 and go from there. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. <clears throat> Just really briefly, um, qualified settlement funds, they're 468B trusts. Um, if you work in the mass or class space, you've certainly heard of them. Uh, they're used to process all sorts of settlements. Um, so when a settlement occurs, it can be paid into your operating, it can be paid into your IOLTA, um, it can be paid into a QSF. And so they're used around complicated settlements, but typically when you're talking about large dollar amounts. And one of the really key concepts of using a QSF regarding tax planning goes is that when funds are paid into a QSF, unlike your IOLTA or operating, they're not yet received. So you have the ability to build a financial plan without yet having taken receipt of the funds. And they can remain there for an extended period of time and oftentimes, if your cases are shared to any degree of commonality, you can pool them in the QSF and build a financial plan around multiple cases. And so a QSF is sort of the first step in giving you time and space to figure out a financial plan to make sure year over year, your law firm is saving on their tax bill. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so once the funds are in a QSF, you haven't received them, but you have the ability to place them into a payment schedule where they can be invested tax deferred. And so what I'm talking about a lot of the times is referred to as an attorney fee structure, um, structured settlement, um, but a structured settlement implies an annuity. Uh, we would typically do this in an investment backed fashion. So you could take the funds, Ted or someone at auction can invest them and grow them for a period of years, and they're paid out to you over time. So you're able to have income spreading where instead of getting 
a $10 million fee, a $1 million fee, a $100,000 fee all at once. Instead, you're able to spread that fee over a period of years, and in the meantime, have it invested. Um, you can go to the next slide. Just one more. And so the basic idea is the defendant agrees to pay the settlement directly into your QSF. The settlement money in the QSF is sitting there for a period of time while you figure out a plan, you create a plan, and the funds are then flown over to Oxygen Financial. They're invested for a period of time. Milestone services the contract and pays them out to you. And so funds flow from the defendant over to Milestone. Milestone opens the account with Oxygen, and then funds flow to you according to the payment schedule. Um, so we see this as a leading strategy for many contingency fee lawyers. If you don't know what this is, you haven't looked into it, you should call Ted, you should call myself, and we can sort of walk you through in more specifics. Um, but I just want to take two minutes to give a high level overview. And, and Sam, is it, it's accurate that this could be done by attorney, it could be done firm-wide. Uh, there's, there's a whole number of ways to set up this construct. Yeah, so pooled qualified settlement funds are very, very popular, especially with personal injury attorneys. So let's say you have a 10 person personal injury a law firm, you're settling all personal injury cases in a certain state. Well, there's a lot of commonality there. So you can create a qualified settlement fund around your firm, pool all those cases together into one QSF, and then you can plan what you do with your fees. When they go into the account, you can take a disbursement directly into your law firm, like the payments you're operating, or they can leave it in the QSF, or you can place them into a payment schedule. So you sort of gain control. So instead of having you know, a really good year and then a less great year, you're pretty much able to even out year over year over year. So you're never worrying about the tax crunch come next April. And this is not an all or none deal. If somebody settles a contingency fee and they get a million dollars, they, they could put a half million dollars in here and keep a half million? Oh, uh, certainly. So typically they would put the whole settlement into the QSF and then take a disbursement from the QSF into their firm for half a million and then choose to defer half a million. Um, so that's what we see a lot of people do uh, sort of to plan uh, their whole law firm strategy through the QSF. So it's just a financial management tool for your law firm. Instead of it being dictated whenever the insurance company is choosing to settle the case is when you get paid, you're able to dictate when you get paid. And so unlike any other serious profession, contingency fee lawyers can choose when they receive their income. So if you're a surgeon and you make half a million dollars a year, you can't control whether or not one year you're gonna get 100,000, one year you're gonna get a million, you get half a million every year. Well, trial attorneys, some years they'll make a million, some years they won't. So this is the ability for them to be able to spread that income over a long period of time and even out those ebbs and flows. Yeah, and we we have found for attorneys across the country, it, it is such a great strategy. It doesn't mean that you couldn't look at doing something like a structured settlement, but then again, you all know how low interest rates are. And one of the advantages is that you control the investment account to this degree that you can kind of buy largely whatever you want. Whereas there are vehicles today, if you do a periodic payment, you may only make 1% or 2%. It's going to be very small in nature. And this... Uh, for a younger attorney, this could be a way to fund your kid's college education. For an older attorney, it'd be like having an unlimited uh, 401k plan. Uh, these, these are all reasons that we've seen attorneys move to using these structures over multiple years or, or sometimes uh, all of their settlement or some of their settlement. So it's been very, very, um, very powerful. Anything else, Sam, to add to this? I would just, I mean, re repeat what, what you just said is most the attorneys I see doing this are more senior attorneys who are receiving large fees. They might not have planned properly for retirement at this point, or they may want an earlier retirement, and they're using it as a very large retirement account. So they're taking that $5 million and turning it into you know, the, their future. And, and consider for everybody on today, when you think about tax planning in general, all right, everything is about when you take constructive receipt of the income. As Sam said, but you know, if today federal taxes are 37%, and obviously some states where some of you live, you have no state income tax, and in some cases it could be like the state of California where you're sub, you know, par 13% or above. 
this could be a 50% tax savings. And, and you consider if you have a million dollars in that got put into here of saving a half million dollars of taxes overall, it's, it's very, very um, significant in terms of what it could be uh, in terms of not only the savings today, but then allowing those dollars to compound over time like they would in a 401k or IRA type plan. And, and we did get one question just really briefly. Yeah. Does this need to, does this need defendant agreement? Um, generally speaking, defendant needs to agree to pay to the qualified settlement fund. It's pretty simple solve. We can name the QSF whatever we need to. And so typically we'll name it the name of your law firm settlement account. So if I had a law firm, it would be the Dolce Law Firm Settlement Account. Um, and with the TIN that's associated with that QSF, there's a whole court process to set these up. Um, and so that entity is what you list in your payee line of your settlement. Um, so typically the insurer just wants to make sure that they have the release, um, the release is agreed to, um, and they won't bat an eye at paying the name of your law firm settlement account, um, client name and the memo line. That's typically how these things receive payment. Um, so defendant needs to agree to pay the QSF. The QSF needs to be listed as the payee within the settlement agreement. Um, that's pretty easy to manage, frankly. Um, it's not really a hard sticking point. Um, and this is how every, I shouldn't say every, how most mass torts that don't go through bankruptcy are resolved, how most class actions are resolved, how most large multi-party cases are resolved. Um, it's been done this way since QSFs were established even before that's designated settlement funds in the 80s. So this is common practice. Mm -hmm. All right, well, <clears throat> I appreciate you going through that, um, Sam. And I think obviously if this is something you're looking at in 2022. Uh, you definitely ought to talk to Sam and myself and we can figure out how to get this structured uh, or set up in your firm. Uh, I do wanna tell you too, before I get into the rest of the presentation, um, obviously there are a lot of people out there that may give you neat tax ideas. I will tell you, from an audit perspective, two of the biggest things that we, we see that either are in audit or getting audited like Johnny on the spot are land conservation easements and also charitable LLCs. So if people are offering you these, I, I would definitely advise to tread lightly uh, on those. Uh, I will tell you there's been a, a subject of discussion about captive insurance companies. And for those of you that are on here that your law firm nets at least a million dollars, but I'd recommend probably $2 million, small captives like 831Bs, which are other ways to potentially reduce income taxation now and provide other benefits. That, that's something you could still look at. That's not, I, I hear, you know, some people say, well, they get audited all the time. It's not our findings right now, especially those that are set up in the United States. But the first two that I mentioned, I would I probably probably tread lightly now. What can we do before 2021? So there's now something in place called the 2021 look back rule. And many uh, law uh, practices, firms that I see, uh, they often will have a 401k plan. In some cases, they'll have a profit sharing plan. But there is a term called a cross-tested solution plan. I'll say that again, a cross-tested solution plan, which allows you to actually have a defined benefit or cash balance plan in conjunction with having the 401k and profit sharing plan. So consider that, you know, when you think about large companies today, a lot of large Fortune 500 companies, they'll have a 401k. In some cases, they'll have a profit sharing plan. Some cases, they'll have a deferred compensation plan, but some of them still have pension plans, which allow the ability uh, for the company to put away dollars uh, for uh, eligible employees. And you as a firm, whether you're a solo practitioner of one or it's just you and you have a family member that does all your staff work, or you are a larger firm that has multiple partners, the deductible contributions that you could still make for 2021 to set one of these up are really, really massive. Um, I'm just giving you some, some guidelines, some baselines that if you're the age of 40, I'm using a ballpark of about 100 grand. And obviously, there are actuarial calculations I have to do when I do these. Uh, but if you're older and you're in that 50 to 60 range or, or above the age of 60, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax deductibility for 2021. The plan has to get set up and ultimately funded by September 15 of 2022 for the 2021 tax year. And then obviously, 
you can do it going forward into 2022. But generally speaking, you have until September if you file an extension of the following year for the tax year prior to fund these plans. And by the way, these can be really significant because a pension plan gives you the ability to have almost you know, unilateral authority with how you in, uh, invest the money. A good example is that GE may have a big pension plan and they invest in real estate. And a lot of attorneys like real estate, but a lot of financial advisors don't like it if you use your qualified money for real estate because they might not make any money. So recognize that there are certain things that you could do in here that would be harder to do with the 401k. It's not that you couldn't do it. It's just that most people uh, won't look at you doing that. So if you made a lot of income last year and you feel like you've got cash that you can save, this can be very impactful. By the way, one of the most misunderstood things about setting up these plans, especially for attorneys like Sam was talk with talking about, that you may have one year where you make a million and a half dollars and then the next two years you make $200,000. These things can still be excellent for that kind of attorney. They just have to be structured the right way. Uh, honestly, most, most uh, financial professionals I run across do not understand really how to structure it. We've set up our own actuarial team, our own pension people. It's taken us years to really create this mousetrap in the right way and do it the right way. But most people just simply don't have the experience. And um, you know, often, like I said, your accountants won't necessarily look at it and go, well, that would be a great idea on, on what to do. Now you'll notice on the right-hand side, I have something called the ultra comp enhancement. When you get the tax savings uh, from these dollars and you do this in the right way, there is a way to leverage the tax savings to basically create something that will create additional tax-free income down the road that literally, when you look at the math, could double your spendable retirement dollars. And so um, normally that pension, again, it depends upon age. Um, you know, the maximum is about $245,000 of income. If you owed roughly $100,000 of tax, there's a way to take those tax savings and do something significantly in our design, which is the ultra comp plan that will allow you to get tax-free income down the road. I think recognize that if you created almost a triangle in your head and you thought about the way that you might facilitate tax savings today and in the future, some assets you're going to put away today and you're not going to get constructive receipts. So no tax now, they're going to grow, going to get tax later. Some assets you're going to choose to pay tax now, get them in vehicles where you'll pay tax never again. The Roth IRA is not the only vehicle that will do that. And then some you'll make the decision to get taxed on that income along the way, i.e. dividends and interest, and then one day capital gains tax. Um, obviously, you might have seen recently here that the, there is a proposal for a billionaire's uh, minimum income tax, where there would be a minimum income tax on people that make, uh, not make, that are worth $100 million or more, so it's not quite billionaires. Not only a 20% tax on income, but one of the things that scares me a little bit more, this is the second push right now for this, because they used to, they tried it last year or the year before as a wealth tax is being taxed on unrealized capital gains. So consider somebody like Jeff Bezos that would have $10,000 in cost basis on Amazon stock, and I'm just making this up, but let's say it was worth a billion dollars now, and he'd actually owe tax on that paper growth before he's ever sold it. That could be true for real estate as well. So we're keeping our eyes out for this because obviously between now and the midterms, there's gonna be a heavy push to compromise or change tax law. We've got to keep an eye on what that's going to look like. But this could go back to 2021. Now, in a smaller perspective, you may still be able to make a 2021 traditional IRA contribution or a Roth IRA for the age of 50 and older. You could have a catch up. If, you're, if you didn't have a 401k profit share, no kind of pension cash balance plan, and you're, you're a small ER firm, uh, you may still look at doing a SEP IRA. Some of you have those now, fully funded up to $58,000. Uh, there could be a catch up on there as well. But um, you know, there are ways, if you do have employees, depending upon how long they've worked with you, to include or exclude certain people from those plans. Depending upon your income, I'm going to throw one out. You might want to look up or I can talk to you more about it called a spousal IRA. 
especially your non-working spouses, you have a spouse that doesn't work. A lot of people, if you've not funded your HSA account or health savings account, to me, it's still the best triple tax-free account that exists out there. Money goes in pre-tax, it grows tax deferred and it comes out tax-free. You can still fund those for 2021 before tax time. I will tell you that one mistake a lot of people would make with their HSAs is they don't invest them. Typically speaking, if you have $2,000 in that HSA account, you can invest it. Uh, no sense in leaving it in a money market account. You're not going to make any cash on that anyway. <clears throat> but over time, these can become very valuable. There is in one tax year, you can elect to make a one-time IRA to HSA election. Um, not going to talk about that today, but these are all things I'd be looking at in your, in your tax plan. Business deductions are huge. Uh, I find, and one of the things we'll offer at the end of this is to look at your last three years of tax returns, but um, <clears throat> most, um, most accountants really don't get deep into trying to talk to you about how to make the business work for you. And most of you that are in business, you want the business to work for you. Yes, I recognize most people don't want to get audited, right? No fun that is. Uh, most people want to do it right. They want to be in the black and white. They don't want to be in the gray. That doesn't mean that you have to be in the gray. It just means understanding what could belong on different sides of the ledger. Uh, a good example I'll tell you is that I often hear, oh, the home office deduction, if you take that, you're going to get audited. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've never seen a home office, uh, a home office audit. I've never seen one. Uh, but there are changes to those rules where the IRS now gives you the ability to take a standard deduction. You could still take a percentage of your of your property, depending upon what you're using for the home office. But that's going to be important. Um, also, making sure that you've got everything together for non-cash charitable contributions. Receipts are going to be important because you're going to fill out something called an 8283 form. Again, one of the things that I'll tell you is that most of you uh you know when you had to pass the bar but most of you haven't read the u.s master tax guide and if you did one of the things that you would find out is where your income level is and what's the average non-cash charitable contributions that somebody took in your income tax bracket so you have to be smart about this but the key is having receipts nine out of ten places are not even going to put any numbers on the receipt so it's going to be up to you to be able to do that and if you're doing long-term tax planning, as long as these loopholes are still around, you might consider doing a backdoor Roth IRA. I'm gonna talk about the mega backdoor Roth IRA in just a minute, even if you cannot deduct the 2021 IRA uh, contribution. Again, feel free to put in questions. I'll make sure I answer whatever I can at the end. If you sold uh, any sort of property or you sold stocks or you sold any kind of business, toward the end of last year, you already triggered a capital gain. And as you know, the top capital gain rate was uh, 20%. That's where it exists today. We'll talk about where it might go in the future. But a lot of people that are in the real estate um, business, they are very familiar with 1031 rules. And a lot of people like that because you can sort of kick the can down the road. And if you bought uh, an apartment building, or you bought a, sh a shopping mall and you paid a million dollars for it and now it's worth three million. Every time you use that 1031, you can continue to kick the can down the road and uh, uh, defer out that capital gain. Last year, there was a proposal to change the rules for the step up and cost basis. Uh, I haven't seen anything new on that yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was one more pass at that because you know, one of your strategies may be kick the can down the road when my kids inherit the property, they'll get a step up on all the basis and they can sell it and I'll avoid that capital gains tax altogether. One consideration you could do if you want to extract your basis out of the property is to look at doing a qualified opportunity fund or a qualified opportunity zone. I don't know what will happen in 2026 yet with, all, with uh, QOZs. But remember, any kind of gain will fit for this strategy. It isn't just real estate, unlike the 1031, uh, crypto, sale of the business, sale of a highly appreciated stock could all fit into this category. And what it essentially allows you to do is pull your basis out of the investments and start to defer part or all of your capital gain. 
And um, the way the laws were structured now, it would allow you to modestly reduce the capital gain tax if you hold the property and uh, eventually pay no tax on the growth of that property over time. So to a degree, it still lets you do real estate, but at the same token, if it grows, all the growth of that, that uh, capital gain, there isn't additional capital gains tax on it. So some of you may have seen this before, you can buy these in a fund, you can do the property yourself, but if you've had, had big capital gains at the end of last year, you still this still may be a decision that you could look at because you're within the six month window if not and you're considering disposing a property this year and you don't want to be hogtied to have to do a 1031 exchange this could be something that that you could look at um and as you think about going into 2022 uh one of the things i just want to remind you because i'm seeing a lot more people buy and access crypto. And I, I'm still hearing from people that the government can never figure out what you have in crypto. Uh, I, I wouldn't make that assumption, but one of the things that you may wanna be thinking about now is the wash rule, uh, the wash rule as it pertains to selling crypto. When you generally buy stock and you sell stock at a loss, you're generally gonna to have to wait more than 30 days, really call it 31 days, in order to be able to buy back that stock and not have your loss disallowed. If some of you are carrying forward losses, those are things that you want to think about how you plan what you sell against those losses. But if you bought crypto uh, towards the end of last year or you bought crypto and you're down on that crypto, uh, crypto sales are not subject to the wash rules now. And what that means is that I could literally sell my Bitcoin or Ethereum. I mean, in eight seconds later, I could buy it back and lock in that loss. The capital losses on that crypto obviously can be offset against other crypto gains, but they could be set against stock gains as well. So if you had heavy stock gain in Google, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and you're thinking about trying to dispose of some of those positions, then you might look at about how you do that tax planning sensibly. I just want to tell you this because I see a lot more people that are hacky sacking with accounts at Gemini or Kraken or Coinbase, and, and some of you may be more heavy duty in it than others. Uh, obviously, uh, maybe Sam will let me do a, a crypto webinar on one of these, but uh, <clears throat> this is something I would, I would look at. When you're thinking about cap gains uh, in general in here, one thing to pay attention to this year is there was another proposal to move cap gains north of 40%. I think last pass of this was to get them at 39.6%. Uh, and, and this is something that you have to debate and consider in your overall plan, because, it, you know, in some degree, when you defer out your gain, you're thinking to yourself, uh, well, uh, I, I may eventually pay. Hopefully gains will capital gains rates will go lower. I'm not of the viewpoint that they're going to get much lower at the high end than where they're at right now. And I'm going to discuss a strategy we've used for some attorneys on how to sort of escape this capital gains, and I'll explain it in just a couple minutes. But if this moves to 40%, um, what the government might want to lead you to believe is that the cap gains rate going from 20% to 40% is a 20% increase, which is not necessarily untrue if you use whole numbers. But if you really look at the math on the data, it's actually 100% in real money. So, because um, sometimes if they move it from 20 to 25, they'll say it wasn't bad. It was only a 5% increase where 20% to 25% is really a 25% increase. And you can see that in your taxes. So just really thinking about how you plan this out and depending upon how you're planning out your whole tax picture is going to be important when you consider when to trigger capital gains. I'm going to come back to that in a second when I share a strategy we've used for some attorneys. If your business for some reason, you know, like Sam mentioned, you may have a year where you make a lot of money and then you have another year where you lose money because cases haven't settled, you want to look at where those operating losses will be in 2022. This should say 2022. And one thing you may want to consider along the way is where you convert uh, traditional IRA accounts if you can do it into Roth accounts, because as it stands today, there's not really an income cliff on you being able to convert existing IRA monies into Roth. Um, this matters a lot because in 2019, 
the IRS changed the rules um, in something called the SECURE Act. And, and basically what it said is it said if a non-spouse beneficiary inherits your IRA account, i.e. your kids as an example, and you, they were able to distribute money out of their IRA over the course of their lifetime. They call these to a degree the stretch IRA rules. Uh, what changed in 2019 is that your kids or non-spouse beneficiary, whether it's a brother, sister, aunt, uncle, um, they're only going to have 10 years to take that money out of IRAs. So one of the things that happened is that they extended the age for you to take required minimum distributions to the age of 72, as opposed to 70 and a half. It looks like a bill now might move that to 75, which is great on one hand, but as those assets pile up and you get older and you die, and your kids inherit that asset, it can be very problematic because if you're 80 years old and you die and your kids are 50 and they're in their peak earning years and they're making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars you you've almost guaranteed that they're they're going to pay the most amount of money on those IRA accounts. So depending upon where you are and how you do it, you may want to consider how you convert, especially if you have a year where you have a loss, you may be able to convert at almost nothing. One of the bigger things that I see is that a lot of law firms do have a 401k plan that's set up. But unfortunately, you've set up that 401k plan with ADP or paychecks or, and this is not a knock on other financial advisors, but there are financial advisors that set them up and they make some fees or some commissions to sell them, but they don't install the right language inside of your 401k plan. Today, obviously, a lot of you are looking at pre-tax contributions. Uh, how much can I max out pre-tax? If I'm the age of 50 or over, can I put away additional money? Yes, and you max out that contribution. So let's say you're putting away $26,000, $27,000 a year. You may even be doing a profit sharing program that takes you up to that $58,000, $60,000 level. But in your plan, the big question that you should be looking at now until they change this rule is, does my plan allow for after-tax contributions? Does my plan allow for after-tax contributions? In addition, does my plan allow for in-service withdrawals? Does my plan allow for in-service withdrawals? Check, check, okay? Those two things are very important, after-tax contributions, in-service withdrawals. If they do, you're allowed to save that after-tax money and then immediately be able to roll that money out of your 401k plan, no taxes, and into a Roth IRA. This concept is known as a mega backdoor Roth IRA. And I believe it's super important, especially if you're on here and you're making 250, 500,000, a million dollars, because Honestly, you could save a lot of money in a pre-tax uh, account, but it sort of puts you between a rock and a hard place to a degree because eventually you're going to have to distribute down the road. And when you do, it's just going to come out wherever the tax rates are when you take it out as ordinary income because you haven't received constructive receipt of that money. If you set up the mega backdoor Roth IRA, you're actually building up this asset that number one, it'll be tax free if you take the money out. Number two, it is not NOT subject to the SECURE Act rules of 2019. And so when you think about the things, both the backdoor and the mega backdoor Roth IRA, I think these are very impactful. The IRS has tried to squeeze in here a little bit on this because of guys like Peter Thiel that have tons of money in a Roth IRA and they go, wait a minute, why does a billionaire have lots of money in a Roth IRA? Something's problematic with that. It is what it is. The rules are what they are right now. You have to take advantage, it, uh, advantage of it where you can. <clears throat> now, I mentioned this going into this year about setting up a defined benefit or a cash balance plan. I'm actually surprised by the number of firms that either haven't looked at this or haven't done it so far, especially if you're putting away uh, lots of money. I'm just showing you an example here that if you're a sole proprietor, that's 55, you have a solo law firm, and let's say your spouse is 55 and they're working in there, doing some part of operations. If the practice is making more than a half million in this case, and you make a million dollars, you're actually gonna be able to do two things. You're gonna be able to do the regular 401k profit sharing plan, 
And as I mentioned earlier, cross-test that with the defined benefit cash balance plan. Uh, this is just an example of one. I believe these people were in their late 50s when I set this up, and they were able to fund away $600,000 pre-tax. $600,000. So it, it's a significant amount of money uh, if you look at this and, and how much dollars you can put away. And as I mentioned, if you have a terrible year, you can actually um, skip a year. Now, one thing I want to mention on here is that when it comes to charitable contributions, uh, you know, there's the regular cash contributions that you can make. And I doubt that most of you are not itemizing, but if you aren't, um, you can actually still get a little itty bitty tax deduction. If you are itemizing, your cash contributions are, are much more significant. But one of the things a lot of attorneys do not look at over time when they build wealth is setting up some sort of family foundation. On here, I use the acronyms CRUT or NIMCRUT, Charitable Remainder Uni Trust, or what's called to be a net income makeup, Charitable Remainder, Remainder Uni Trust. You know, a lot of times you hear the old adage that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I just want you to imagine for a second, if you had land that you bought, a property that you bought, you had stock that you bought, that you essentially bought for almost no cost basis. Let's say it was $100,000. And now the value of whatever that asset is, crypto, stock, real estate, it could just be raw land is now $5 million. The problem that everybody faces is that uh, it's sort of, do I let the tax tail wag the dog? And when I sell that stock, I'm probably gonna owe on $5 million, at least a million in federal, plus what I might owe state. So imagine instead that I donated this $5 million to my own charity. Now, if I donated it to my own charity and many, many wealthy politicians and athletes have their own foundations and charities, I would immediately get a $5 million tax deduction. Now that tax deduction can be spread out over a number of years and generally it's gonna be up to 50% of your adjusted gross income. So if you made a million dollars out of that 5 million tax deduction, you could use a half million dollars. This means you only pay tax on 500,000. Once the money is in the charity, I can do one of two things. It could be required to make me a payout. Let's say that average payout is 5%, which means it's gonna give me $250,000 of income until the day that I die. Yes, I will have to pay tax on that income. If I don't need it, I can do the NIM, or what stands for net income makeup, and I can let that basically defer inside of the foundation and take it down the road. In many cases, what I'll find with attorneys is that we'll set up something called a wealth replacement trust, and there's a way to replace that $5 million of assets for your kids or your family as well. It's very powerful stuff, but the way the tax law is structured as it stands today, setting up things where it's more blessed to give than it is to receive for assets that are highly appreciated can work substantially in your favor. So if you built up some wealth, and you've got those appreciated assets, this is a, a multi-year strategy that can work aggressively uh, in your favor. I also think that a lot of business owners uh, aren't really on, and neither are accountants, it's just surprising to me, um, on section 179 deductions, because the way that the tax law changed, not only did it bump up section 179 deductions, which means that you could get almost a full uh, first year write-off, but the tax law changed to offer something called bonus depreciation. Again, you may be being talked about this with your, your tax advisors today, whether it's a financial advisor or a CPA, you may not. Point of it behind this is not all 179 deductions are 6,000 pound cars. Uh, there are a lot of cars that qualify for this, but there are equipment and other items that fall underneath here that could allow you to buy the things that you buy and get a significant write-off. And if you're thinking about buying automobiles in general, you may look at what you put in the business and what you don't and why um, and who's on payroll. Uh, these are all uh, considerations, but I'd be looking closely at this until the laws change about 179. As you think about the rest of 2022, obviously I mentioned captives. Uh, right now you can put away up to 2.3 million in here and get a tax deduction. The specific code on this um, I look at is Section 831B. You may also declare your state of residency. Obviously, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of people move to states like Tennessee, 
uh, Texas and Florida, when you think about the East Coast and the West Coast, more and more people, even though it's the least populated state still, move to Wyoming. Uh, Nevada as a crossover coming out of California. Uh, not that many moving to Alaska, but when you look at the nine states that really have no state income tax, that can be a consideration. There's still a pretty wide open deal depending upon what you want to do um, in uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a lot more complicated than this webinar, uh, but those are considerations as well. I'm a big fan of putting the kids on payroll. I have three kids. Uh, you actually have to follow the rules and do it the right way. But given that the standard deduction moved north of $12,000 now, this could be a really great sort of pre-tax way to save into 529 plans. Um, and you may even want to set up a 529 plan for yourself. Uh, that vehicle is not just for college or high school. It's a very interesting vehicle in the way it stands today and how it works with your estate. Um, and in many states, you also get a state income tax deduction for the plans in that state. If you can't save as much, you might want to consider, consider a simple IRA. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, if you are older and getting closer to taking required minimum distributions, consider how the SECURE Act is going to impact that. Last couple things in here is uh, I'd see if your state offers state tax credits. In a state like Georgia, where I live, there is a significant tax reduction for low-income housing and film credits. Every state, and we become pretty good at looking at what every state offers and what they don't, there could be a way to save on your state taxes. But again, this could be significant depending upon the income that you get. And if you're really getting taxed like crazy on dividends or interest, um, you're going to see rates start to tick up in mini bonds. I'd recommend for most people look at opening up an I-bond account. Obviously, depends on your situation. I-bonds can be bought directly through the government, currently paying 7.12%, not too shabby. Um, so this is, I know, just a lot. It's like a, sort of a, Sam and I would say it's like water uh, through a fire hose. But um, if you're interested in having us look at your last three years of tax returns, we've done this for thousands of attorneys. Um, we're happy to do it. If you go to oxygenfinancial.com and just request a, a consultation, I'll make sure that myself and one of our, our, uh, our experts here, or multiple experts are on that call, we'll give you a bunch of ideas on what you may be able to do now. If you work with us, we work fee only, and our clients are our business owners. That's who we work with. But over the years, working with uh, Milestone and other people across the country, we really understand uh, trial lawyers, uh, contingency fee attorneys in general, and that's the area that we specialize in. So, Sam, I'm going to turn it back to you. I know we got about 10 minutes to go just to see if there's any questions in general, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Great. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, so, I'm pretty sure everyone on realizes why this is our most heavily attended webinar every year. Um, we do two of these a year regarding the tax issues as they are popping up and um, typically afterwards we're able to do some good for a lot of trial attorneys um, really interesting stuff here uh, especially on this year almost more than any other year it's a changing tax environment um, and so a lot of the guidance that's being given is extremely relevant right now um, and hopefully will be relevant in six months to two years um, but as things continue to change, um, it's, I think it's really important to continue to reach out to people who are staying up to date with the latest information and making sure that they're applied to whatever is happening in your world. Um, because as our world continues to change, uh, we need to be able to change with it, right? Um, and so I just want to say thank you again to Ted. Um, I'm stalling a little, little bit, waiting to see if any questions come in. Um, does anybody have any general questions? I know we covered a lot of ground. Um, yep. And you can also just ask them to us personally if you want to set up for a consultation, uh, which is pretty easy to do through the link. I know Oxygen has a really nice setup. Yeah, if anyone yeah. wants to privately, just go to go to the website and set it up. And uh, we're, we're happy to talk. And uh, there's a lot going on. And you know, I always say, Sam, it's, it's not about what you make, it's about what you keep. Well said. All right. Um, I think we're all good then, Dad.
Um, thank you everyone for, for attending today. Um, really, and it's always awesome to have you on. Thanks so much. Um, you're gonna be getting a call from me, frankly, because there's something there that uh, I have to talk to you about, but um, thank you everyone again. And uh, this is the latest edition of Milestones webinar series. Uh, you know, we'll have them going about one every two weeks or so. And we try to bring you the best people in whatever industry we're talking about that day. Um, Ted Jenkins, when it comes to tax and tax planning from a financial and fiduciary perspective is quite literally the best in the country. So thank you again, Ted. Awesome having you here. Right. And, you know, really looking forward to uh, helping some more attorneys with you. Uh, Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.